Today, in this discussion, I'd like us to finalize, finish up, and close off this entire mechanism of philosophical questions. We're going to expose the limits, the use, the shortcomings, the accelerations, and all the little details and inflections of philosophical questions. So right from the get-go, I'd like to say that the way to answer a philosophical question is to ask another question. It really is that simple. But I'd like to unpack the limits and the restraints of this process. We can go into a little bit of the history of this process. And I'd like to open it up to a few other little ways that we can answer philosophical questions. Because we can create a few categories for ourselves. We can divide things, intellectualize things. That's what we often do in these conversations. So we're expanding this concept of answering philosophical questions and asking philosophical questions. I've come up with a cute little analogy that might help us understand what questions are, what they're used for, and why they exist. Have you ever wondered why we have questions? Have you ever worked out what the difference is exactly between a statement and a question? But the analogy goes like this. This is our thought experiment. Put yourself through this little thought experiment for a moment. You're in a foreign country. And this is a country where you don't speak the language. You're not familiar with the language. And you're in a busy town centre, maybe at a maybe at a cafe, ordering breakfast. And there's a hustle and a bustle about. You're hearing these sounds and you're enjoying this different culture. You're on your travels around the world. You're on your round-the-world trip that you're going to do. And just across from you are two people having a conversation in a completely different language to what you know or understand. You have absolutely no idea what it is they're talking about. Now, this conversation that's happening between two people is going to have one guy telling a story to another person. So, one person's listening, and one person's telling the story. This is a pretty stock standard format for a conversation. There are other formats, but we don't want to get too deep into the details of conversation mechanics. Here, we've just got someone telling a story. So there is a picture or a series of events, experiences and sounds and all the rest of it in one of these person's heads and they're trying to get it across to the other person. So they're using words to describe the events. They're putting them in a setting. They're telling them about the process. They're telling them about little details. They're using emotive language to express what's more important and what's not. And if they're a good storyteller, they can really bring it to life and express what is in their head in such a way as that it's interesting for the person listening. What might happen as the person is listening to this story is they might think up something that is missing from the story. They might imagine that there's something they don't understand about the story. Or there will be a part of the story they'd want to know more about because they're interested in that part of the story and the person telling the story hasn't given them enough information. And so a question is born. A question is born when a person thinks there's more to the story than they know. 
and they want to find out what exactly is going on. And this is the mechanics of all kinds of questions. This is really what a question is. A question is a request for more information. If the person telling the story has given enough information, or the person hearing the story isn't really quite interested, then there's going to be no more questions. There really has to be some sort of engagement, some sort of emotional investment from the listener, and emotional interest from the speaker, person telling the story, if there's going to be a situation arising where questions are natural. All questions arise out of this need to have more information. And you can only have the impulse to want more information if you know that there's more to the story than you've got. Concordantly, there's also got to be an emotional investment. You have to care in the story. You have to care about the outcome of the story. There must be a significance to the difference between knowing about this part of the story and not knowing about this part of the story. Now, there are a whole category of mundane kinds of questions. These are industrious questions. These are practical questions. These are pragmatic questions. They're black and white questions. Where's the pair of scissors? Which way to the bank? What date will I meet you on? Which coffee shop are we going to meet at? These are black and white, clear-cut, straight-ahead sort of questions which have a black and white answer. So we don't classify these as philosophical questions. These sort of questions you wouldn't answer with another question unless they were not really clarified correctly, or there was more information that the person needed in order to answer the question. So if someone asks you a question and you don't understand how to package the information in response, you're going to answer that question with another question. You don't have enough information about the question, so you need to have more information. And that's how we get this back and forth between questions answering with questions. Philosophical questions are the ones we put into the category of not really having a tangible answer. They're not black and white. Questions like, what is the meaning of life? Or, why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What does it mean to exist? What is the purpose of life? What is life? What is reality? These are the sort of questions that we ask and categorize as philosophical questions because they don't have a black and white answer like, which way to the bank and which coffee shop will I meet you at? And these are the sort of questions you want to answer with another question. This is known in Greek philosophy as the Socratic method. So Socrates, one of the great pioneers of Western philosophy, understood very well this process of asking questions as a way of revealing information. He would go around and talk to people, just random people, about things like what is bravery? What is virtue? What is the good life? What does it mean to be pious? What does it mean to be religious? How do we appease the gods? These sort of questions. And most people he spoke to, he realized couldn't pin down their answer and didn't have very good answers for the follow-up questions. So he'd be looking for recontextualizing the situation. He'd be reframing the questions and the subjects in order to build up a stronger picture of what it is that answers these questions. The story goes something like that Socrates 
was told by an oracle that he was the wisest man in all the land. And Socrates knew that he wasn't the wisest man. He was well aware of his ignorance. So he set out on a mission to prove this oracle wrong. He went off and found people who were supposedly wise, supposedly knew more than him, and he would test his knowledge against them. He'd use this Socratic method, as it's known today, to find out what things actually are. He's inquiring into the nature of what things are. Through this process, he would reveal to himself that these wise people didn't really know what was going on. And for him, that would build a more of an understanding, a more detailed understanding of the answers to these sort of questions. But he still wouldn't fully know. So he would be improving his understanding without really getting to the bottom of it. And he would still remain in his ignorance. He was still aware of his ignorance. Even after going through this process of finding more information, building an understanding, clarifying parameters. And in that way, he was more wise than others. His wisdom was in knowing his ignorance, whereas other people walked around with these answers to questions, thinking that they were the correct answers and they were final answers, whereas Socrates knew that he didn't have the final answers. And in that sense, he was able to make more way into a deeper understanding and a more complex understanding. Now, was Socrates a genius? I don't know. There are definitely some hardcore stories about him, about how he could drink, about how he had incredible self-restraint, about how hardworking he was, about how charismatic he was and how much people come to love him when they became friends with him. But it's definitely clear from a scholarly point of view that Socrates' place in our history would not have been anywhere near it would have been without Plato writing about him. And the scholars can spend their careers deciding about what Socrates said and what he did and whether it was Plato putting his own ideas into the mouth of Socrates and how much of it was real or not. And they can play that game. That's very fine for them. That's a fun game to play if you're interested in that. But here we just want to take the principle of the Socratic method, which is asking questions as a way of inquiring into the nature of things. And the only problem with this, the only assumption that you need in order to get this question mechanism up and running, is that you have to be comfortable with not knowing the answers to things. Now we can apply our pre-conventional, conventional and post-conventional tiers to this process. So a pre-conventional person thinks that you ask a question and you come up with an answer and that's good enough. It's one dimensional. The answer is the answer, and there's no point taking it further. Conventional person can see that there's no answer. You can come up with other answers. So you ask a question, you can brainstorm multiple answers, and then you choose one of your answers. And there's no point taking it any further because it's just a bottomless pit. It's a spiraling pit. That's conventional thinking. That's a few more dimensions than just pre-conventional thinking. But the post-conventional thinking is where we want to get to because post-conventional understands the whole game that's going on. They know that there are multiple answers to come up with. They know that answers are groundless and questions are groundless. And yet we still choose to embrace this method 
and go through this process in order to reveal understanding and in order to build up more of an understanding. There is a famous piece of philosophy literature about the trial and death of Socrates. And this is when he'd been walking around pissing people off, all these pre-conventional and conventional people, by asking them questions because he'd revealed their ignorance to them and they weren't ready to accept it. They weren't ready to go into the post-conventional. They weren't ready to be okay with having no answers and yet still go through the process of finding answers. It takes more complexity. It takes more nuance. It takes a bit of humility to do that. So he ended up pissing a whole bunch of people off and they put him on trial. And he just lays out his reasoning. He just completely smashes out why he should be defended and completely clarifies his whole process. If you want to understand Socrates, you should read The Trial and Death of Socrates by Plato. There's also a chapter in there about one of the other people who are in court. And he goes through the Socratic method, asking this person about why they're in court and why they're charging the person they are and what is it they're actually charging them with. And it turns out this man is charging his own father with a crime that he can't even define. And Socrates reveals this to him, but he's unable to accept it. So in the end, it seems like both these people are ignorant of the nature of this crime. And yet Socrates is better off because he is aware of his ignorance of this definition. There's a lot to discuss around Socrates, and it's fascinating stuff to study his philosophies and his dynamics and the books. And there's a lot to discuss about his literature and the things that are written about him by Plato. So you can go and read them for yourself if you want to do further research. But I think what we should do now is come up with a few different categories of questions. So we know we've got practical questions. And we know we've got philosophical questions. We know that all questions come from a place of ignorance. and They all require the gathering of information, the clarifying of information. A well-developed environment of learning cultivates the allowing of questions. So it is hard for students to have the courage to ask questions because it shows your ignorance. And you're, If you're in a classroom, there is always that thing of not wanting to ask a question because you should already know the answer. How can you not know the answer already? You should know it. And that hangs over a lot of students. There's no such thing as stupid questions, just stupid people. Some teachers are quite bad at cultivating the ability to ask questions. And likewise, there is always that student that asks too many questions. They're just aware of, oh, I need to be sure that I've got it right. And they're not sure enough in themselves. So they're always asking questions, and really they sort of do know the answers. They're just second-guessing themselves. There are also a few psychological mechanisms to be aware of when asking questions. Because it's possible to ask a question out of your own pride, out of your own sense of smartness, your own smugness. This would be someone who asks a really complicated question and already knows the answer in a sort of way. And they're just asking it in order to sound smart, in order to show how much they can reveal of the situation. And it is possible to do that. It is, ask, it is possible to ask a question 
which really digs at the heart of the matter and draws out exactly what it is that's trying to be expressed and clarified. Some questions are really relevant to the whole of the story that is being told. Some questions force the person telling the story into summarizing the whole thing and just getting to the point. Like, what's the point of the story? What's the principle? What's the virtue at play here? What's the moral of the story? That's a good question. That's a pretty stock standard way of clarifying everything, is you say, what's the moral of the story? And sometimes that's an expression of being disinterested in the story. This is when you say, so what? Or, what's the point? What's your point? What are you saying? I can hear your story, but what are you saying? And this sort of question comes from someone who's tired of listening to the story. And they don't think there's any significance to it. So they just ask a blunt question. So when asking questions, be aware of these mechanisms. There's usually a emotive color to the asking of a question. For example, it's possible to ask a question if you think someone is wrong about something. If someone's telling you a story, or someone's de delivering a concept to you, and you don't believe a word of it, you think it's wrong and you're trying to reject it, there are a category of questions which will reveal that to the person telling the story. These would be questions such as, you haven't considered this. Or questions such as, it's in contradiction to this. How do you reconcile this and this? So you're putting a counterpoint into your question, which is delivering the question in such a way that it makes it difficult for the person telling the story to account for that in their story. And this is a good debate technique. If you are asking someone questions, cross-examining them in a debate, you want to use these sort of questions. You want to try and push and reveal the ignorance of the story and bring that to the forefront. In a debate, you don't really need to show how smart you are. You only need to show how ignorant and incomplete your opponent is. But we also have a few other kinds of questions that we can talk about. How about scientific questions? So these would be questions which have a clear method and structure to how they can be answered. And you must answer that question within the prescribed formal structure. This is the scientific method. It's all about formality, solidifying what counts as adequate evidence, and coming up with a process of answering the question that is within the framework of science. There are also rhetorical questions. So these are similar to philosophical questions, but rhetorical questions are designed to open up that story in your mind in such a way as you have never considered before. It needs to be understood that the person asking the rhetorical question knows the answer to it. These are usually for questions that are a little bit more abstract, a little bit more philosophical. And asking rhetorical questions is a good way to give birth to insight for the other person. It's a technique that I use here quite a lot in our discussions, in our conversations. I try not to use it too much, but it is quite central to trying to impart information. Because if you ask a question, the mind naturally wants to come up with an answer and a lot of what I'm trying to impart is not, here's the information, take it on, but rather a process of, here's the philosophical problem, 
learn to come up with an answer. So I'm trying to teach processes of thought rather than feeding questions, feeding answers. So rhetorical questions try to get you to think for yourself. In the Zen Buddhism tradition, rhetorical questions are known as koans. So there is a whole process of koans that you can go through like a course to become a Zen master. And these would be questions that are posed to you in order to make you think about them, in order to open up something in your mind. And if you come up with an answer that's too easy, too quick, the Zen teacher will hit you on the head with a stick. Or he'll tell you, not good enough, go away. These are usually quite simple questions, at least appearing simple on the surface, such as, who am I? You've heard about this one before, haven't you? Who am I? Just what the hell is going on? Or what about, where is home? Can you answer that question? Where is home? And a lot of these Zen koans are designed to open up answers within the trainee Zen Buddhist that are not based in words. So you ask this question of yourself, and what comes to mind is not an explanation. It's not a sentence, a paragraph, an essay, a thesis. That would be intellectualizing the answer. But the answer on a deeper level is more about the experience. It's about the feeling. It's about digging into your phenomenological experience. It's much more mystical. And this is at the heart of contemplation, which is asking yourself questions of yourself. So contemplation is not a matter of a person telling a story and you're asking them questions. And philosophical questions is more about finding a question that someone's posing to you. It's quite abstract. We might put on another level contemplative questions, contemplative questions. And this is where you're coming up with your own philosophical questions. The insight is being born into yourself. You're being introspective. So you can come up with your own introspective questions, which can only be answered by you. So some questions are answered through a universal. Some questions are answered the same for everyone. And some questions can only be answered adequately by what you come up with. There are questions like, are you doing the best job that you can do? Are you being as efficient with your time as you can be? Do you know what you want to get out of life? Do you know what your ideal is? Whatever you're doing right now, where did you get the idea to do this? What gave you this idea? Whichever which idea it is, where did it come from? What does the ideal outcome of this action look like? This thing that you're working on, this thing that you're doing, what's its point? What's its ultimate? What's it look like in its perfection? in its perfect form. So these are introspective questions which don't have textbook answers. And they don't have universal answers because they only suit you and your situation. And only you can ask them of yourself and within yourself. And this brings up an interesting point 
or another broad pillar of philosophical questions, which is who's asking who the question? Who's the one asking the question? And who are they asking? Who are you asking this question? Most of the time we only ask other people questions. So in the case of our friends sitting in the foreign country, listening to two people speak in a foreign language that they don't understand a word of, this is a story between the two that is trying to be shared. This is one person asking another person a question. But as we've seen as we've been talking along and having this discussion, it's possible to ask yourself questions. So you are asking something of yourself to reveal more of a story which is within you. And we call that introspection. We call that contemplation. And to really give birth to your own insights and your own mechanisms of thoughts, you need to get this idea of asking yourself questions up and running. So it's possible for someone to feed you philosophical questions, and it's possible to some, for someone to give you introspective questions. There are lists of stock standard introspective questions. To really get it up and running and to have your own mechanism, you need to be able to create your own questions. Ask them for yourself and answer them for yourself. Introspective questions are where the snowball starts to happen. The snowball of doubt. The snowball of not understanding what's going on. And the glimmer of seeing that there's more to understand than you already understand. And keep in mind that it's a bottomless pit. It's a groundless ground. It's an endless game. But it's very different to be sitting around with no answers and no questions, having never wondered, and sitting around being content, having wondered everything. You are going to have to build up your mechanism of questions. Build up your desire for information, for knowledge, for different ways of thinking, for finding things within yourself. How many things are actually within you? How many answers can you come up with? There are more answers within you than there are without you. And these are the answers that are more relative to you because they're more alive, they're more real to you. And you have to get this up and going. You have to get the snowball rolling. Soon you'll just be a big ball of questions. Because you'll ask another question. And this will lead to another question. And this will show more of your ignorance. This will show more of what you don't know. And the picture becomes bigger and bigger. Until you see that there's, there's no way for, for, for you to get out of it. There's no way to get out of it. How do we resolve this question? How do we find something to stand on? How do I get somewhere with this? The ground beneath me is falling away. All my questions are falling away. They're leaving me with nothing. They're leaving me with doubt, uncertainty, misapprehension, confusion. And worrying about this confusion and this loss is a big step in the process of questioning everything. It's perhaps a classic little piece of graffiti that everyone likes to do every now and then. Spray paint written on the wall. Question everything. And then underneath, of course, someone writes, why? <laughs> Which actually reminds me of a cute little story of... Something that happened to me when I was first getting into philosophical questions. So, I like to go to the beach sometimes and sit and uh, stare into it for hours on end. And so this involves just 
driving over to the beach, sitting there in tiny country town with no one around. And so anyway, I was on this I was on this trip once, a few hours or days or whatever, and I'd been contemplating the world and reality and philosophy. And I go into the bathroom, one of these desolate, hidden public toilets. You can only imagine how bad it smells. I sit down to do my business, and on the back of the door was written a philosophical question. Someone had written right bang in the middle this philosophical question, which is, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? And it was the last place in the world that I thought I would see something profound, something amazing, something that could hit me in the forehead with power and might. It's the most unexpected thing to see what someone had written underneath. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Someone had written, Why is my bum hole itchy? And, oh man, <laughs> it was the best philosophical question. It really got me that time. So, you never know what form a philosophical question is going to take. And you never know when something profound is actually going to be <laughs> turned into something profane. In fact, offensive questions and questions which you say by answering, oh, I'm not going to justify that with an answer. You know, that's a classic answer to a question that you find offensive. This is another form of questions which are pointed towards the dynamic between two people interacting with each other. So it's possible to get people to admit to certain things. It's possible to paint the picture of someone as a demon and to demonize someone. This is basically police interrogation or terrorist interrogation. There's a whole theory of interrogation and what it means to extract information from someone. So I don't really understand interrogation techniques, but it's definitely possible to force an answer. And it can be quite charged, emotionally charged, when you're asking pointed questions or questions that force an answer. So your questions reveal what sort of interest you have, what sort of complexity you have, and what's most important to you. The sort of questions that you ask reveal how ignorant you are, or just what process you're involved in. The materialist rationalist paradigm, which would be orange on the spiral dynamics, waves of de development, doesn't have time for philosophical questions. And the dogmatic, religious, blue wave of development on spiral dynamics thinks that philosophical questions are answered by God. They're answered by a text. There are answers to philosophical questions. This would be our pre-conventional and conventional. And it's not really until you get to yellow on your spiral dynamics that you start to understand the mechanism of questions and you use it as a tool in and of itself. So how to answer all philosophical questions is to ask another question. It also depends on the kind of question. But with this in mind, you also do know, you do need to understand the other end of the spectrum or the other finality of this mechanism or the ability to trap this mechanism in its totality, which is to answer the question. So I often get asked simple questions or dumb questions which don't really have a right or a wrong answer. And in that case, any answer will do. So there's a lot of the time, 
There's another, there's another aspect of questions which is just coming up with any old answer. And in this sense, you can answer all philosophical questions by coming up with an answer that will do. So this would be an adequate explanation. Now what's adequate as an explanation depends on the conviction of the person who is giving the answer. So we idolize gurus and philosophers with beards and people of intellectual stature because we somehow believe that the answer they give is better than the answer we can come up for ourselves. So the reason we have philosophers and people like gurus or people that we follow is because we think our answers are not good enough. We think what we come up with is not good enough. If we could have our own conviction, then we could answer philosophical questions with concrete answers for ourselves. For example, the meaning of life is what you make of it. And that's a pretty philosophical, trendy answer to give. This would be green on our spiral dynamics. This would be pluralism, postmodernism on spiral dynamics, models, waves of development. But for those of you who want more of an answer and more of an explanation, that's a pretty cheap answer. They might want more of a elaboration, more of a reasoning behind it, more of a process behind it more depth behind it. And the answer a person gives really depends on the conviction that they have within themselves. I mean, we can only give the answers that are real to us, but it appears that people have more authenticity than others. There are people who have been through this process of questioning things and thought about things and it's them that have the deeper answers. It's them that have more weight between their conclusions that they draw. So the way to answer a philosophical question is to know when to probe for more information and when to conclude your information. And you can do that by answering it within yourself or gathering information from others. You can answer it academically or scientifically or intellectually. But at the end, what really matters is how you are convinced by it, the significance of it. If you can allow yourself to open up to these larger questions and go on the process of building a deeper significance, you can make great gains in your existential understanding. This is existential inquiry. This is questioning the world, the place that you're in. So we've talked about asking questions of other people, and we've talked about questions asking of yourself. How do you ask the world a question? How do you ask God a question? How do you ask the entirety of reality a question? And how do you develop the answers? You find the answers. You do the pros and the cons of the answers. You choose better answers. You have better experiences of the answers. And you actually build up a stronger conclusion through doubt to these bigger questions. Most people don't even realize this is possible. And most people don't realize the satisfaction and joy that comes from answering these questions. And that's because they haven't really seen someone who's done this process. Most people just say, ah, oh, philosophy all just ends in circles and there's no point to it. And that's exactly right. They are correct in saying that. It's true that philosophy is a bottomless pit. At the end, we do have to draw conclusions. But some conclusions have more weight behind them than others. Not everyone is equal in their ignorance. 
Socrates and the men that put him on trial are both ignorant. Yes, they both have no idea what's going on. Yes, they both can't answer philosophical questions. But Socrates has a deeper conviction in his ignorance. And for that sense, he's better off. So how to answer philosophical questions? Well, it's to give an ignorant answer, which is more authentic, more significant, and more real to you on a personal level. It's really a matter of choosing what you want to live in. It's really a doorway into choosing your own reality. So you'll hear a lot of new age, human potential, personal power, sort of self-help gurus talking about things like, oh, you create your own reality, or your mind can bend reality, or things like this where they say you are the instigator of your own actions. You have to take 100% responsibility. You have to build your own life. You're in your own situation. You know, all this sort of new age woo-woo stuff, feel-good personal development self-help stuff is in a sense only half correct. It's the right intuition, but the way into that in an authentic way is to be asking deep questions and knowing that your conclusions are as false as when you've started, but in a different qualitative way. So we all have to eat the meal of ignorance. It's just a matter of what flavor do you want to be tasting? And the way to navigating that and changing that dynamic and changing that process and creating your own reality, creating your own truths, is by asking questions and choosing your own answers and finding them for yourself. The stronger you are with asking questions, the stronger you'll be in knowing your own ignorance. And I hope that doesn't twist your brain too much because it's a little bit contradictory. It's a little bit paradoxical. We can have a whole conversation about contradictions. There are mechanisms that we can use to navigate contradictions exactly in the same way as there's mechanisms that we can use to answer all philosophical questions. Thanks very much for tuning in. My name is Andrew. And how are you going today? I hope it's not a sensitive subject for you to answer how you're going. If it's not too philosophical to ask, how's your day going? Have a beautiful day. We'll be back soon with more.